All right. Happy Wednesday. Sun is shining. We're all relaxed, ready, and rested. Uh, any questions about uh, the lab, uh, the quiz, any of the assembly procedure stuff we've been looking at? Yeah. How could this, like, you know, ask us to return the last item of the array? There's no way that you don't say in a parameter that's the last of the array. Yes, so the question on the quiz so was asking about getting the last element. Uh, when we have arrays and are passing them around in C, what we're doing is passing around a pointer to the first element of the array. This contains no information about the length of the array. If it's a string, we don't necessarily need the length because there's a special thing that's going to tell us where the array sort of ends. But in general, you have to also pass in the length as a parameter. Um, there's just no other no other alternative. Um, if you need the length information, it has to be has to be passed along with the address of the, the start of the array. Clock. I also have the same question on the quiz. If you were taught like, never mind. <laughs> All right. Uh, so <clears throat> agenda for today is we're going to uh, take a kind of more detailed look at how memory is laid out, what the different kind of regions of a program's memory are, and some properties of those. We'll uh, look at, uh, I'll kind of do a, a demo and kind of look at how this shakes out in practice, and we'll see that in practice there are ways that it's more, more complicated than the, the simple metal, mental model. Uh, that we'll use. Uh, and then we'll uh, look at a few more things about uh, procedure calls and do some practice uh, so that we're all set to talk about buffer overflows on Friday. So, regions of memory. So I have a picture of memory. We have a huge array of bytes. Each has a unique address. The low address you know, 64 bits, all zeros. Highest address 64 bits, all ones. And uh, what's the region of memory that we've we've talked about so far? Stack. Yeah, we have. The stack at the kind of high uh, range of addresses. Uh, when the stack gets bigger, which addresses does it does it use to do that? Huh? I believe as it grows, it uses the lower addresses. Exactly. Our stack's going to grow uh, down into lower addresses, and we consider kind of what goes in this region of memory. Who is responsible for kind of allocating or deallocating or otherwise managing that region of memory? Uh, and we're also going to think about the permissions. What are you allowed to do with those bytes of memory? So what are things that, that go on the stack that we've talked about? Uh, yeah, a particular kind of variables. Uh, yeah, we might often call them kind of local variables, variables that are defined kind of in a particular scope. Um, what would be another kind of variable that wouldn't, like, it's not local? 
Yeah, global variables. Arguments would be a, like would just be another kind. They're a variety of local variables because they only exist inside you know whatever function. Um, so global variables they're going to have to live you know somewhere in here, uh, and we'll we'll get to that. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll we're actually going to have a region called static. Data, or we can just think about this as global variables. Um, why might we use the word static to describe the part of memory that holds global variables? Yeah, yeah kind of when the program starts, we're going to allocate space for those global variables, and then this allocated space kind of doesn't change. Like, the global variables are known when the program starts because they're, they exist the whole time the program is running. So they're kind of allocated here at the start, and then you know, they just exist the whole time the program runs. So it's unlike the stack, it's not sort of allocating and deallocating as we go. Can I give that example of global variables? Uh, yes, yeah, so in a moment I'll kind of demo kind of in C code what all these different kind of we'll see all the different things that we'll we'll look at here. Um, all right, who manages our, our stack? Kind of, what is responsible for kind of allocating and deallocating stuff on the stack? Kevin? Uh, I believe yeah, it's, uh, the RSP register is, is a factor in kind of what determines, like, what, uh, who determines what happens to RSP? Yeah. Exactly. This is it's meaning the kind of stack is managed automatically or by the compiler. Like when we compile our program, nowhere in the C code did it say like subtract from RSP and then add to RSP. This is all kind of the compiler knows how much stack memory this function needs. And kind of automatically handles that appropriately. Um, is there anything else that we've talked about being on the stack? What? The pointer to where the function about it is. Yeah, a pointer to. What about the kind of previous function? Where it picks up to right after the function call. Yeah, and so it's like where we should go when we return from the current function call. Um, so the, the return address, uh, anything else about function calls that we know go, can go on the stack? Yeah, call saved registers as well as um, arguments beyond the sixth that we need to pass to some function we're calling. Kind of all these different pieces of what we might call procedure context. The most important one of these being the return address. But there's like stuff about making procedures work that goes on the stack. Um, In terms of permissions, there are three different things that we, uh, at least uh, typically, that we control about what you can do with a particular byte or a particular region in memory. And uh, anyone have ideas about what these three might be? Fine. Um, I assume like one of them would be to change it, and one of them would be to copy what's in there to something else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we on the stack we can read things. 
we can write things, so that's we can change those bytes, we can read the values there, say copy them somewhere else. The third kind of thing is execute. We're actually going to keep track of are we allowed to execute an instruction that is stored in this region? And for the stack, the answer is no. Uh, you can't have code stored in the stack and then run it. So it's readable, it's writable, but not executable. Uh, why would we want it to not be executable? Or um, So as we'll see on Friday when we talk about buffer overflows, uh, it's very easy to for someone using a um, insecure program to put arbitrary data onto the stack. And uh, when you do uh, the attack lab, lab three, you will actually, not only will you put arbitrary data onto the stack of a vulnerable program, you will put code onto the stack of a vulnerable program and use that code to take control of that program. So generally, we don't want people to be able to take control of our programs by providing them input. And one way to prevent that is by making the stack not executable. Fine. Is that what code injection is? Yes, you will be performing code injection attacks. So how, how do you actually make it not executable? Uh, so this is something that um, uh, is a combination of the operating system and the hardware. Uh, as we'll talk about later in the course, every time we access memory, it's actually going through, uh, it's sort of via the operating system. Uh, and so the operating system can enforce the property that, oh, addr memory addresses in this range, you're not allowed to execute uh, things stored there. Um, and somewhat troublingly, this wasn't possible in 32-bit x86. Only when we moved to 64-bit in the early 2000s did it become possible to make the stack not executable. So uh, this was certainly a big deal security-wise as it like prevented a, a wide range of relatively straightforward attacks. All right, so read, write. Um, our static data also read, write, but not executable. Um, <clears throat> so for kind of who manages the static data, um, our stack was kind of managed by the compiler. So at the time the program is compiled, all the sort of manage management of the stack is baked in to the program. Uh, for our static data, We would say that it's sort of managed statically, or basically means at, when the program is initialized, when it first starts up, that's when this kind of static data is allocated and set up. Uh, all right. Uh, another region of memory that we need to put up here. Block. Um, a heap. Yes, we will have the heap. And uh, the heap can also grow and shrink. Uh, any guesses, given this diagram, which direction the heap's going to grow? Exactly. There's only, there, if it grew down, it would start overriding our static data. So it needs to uh, add, grow to high addresses. And we can see that the heap is like somewhere in the middle between our low and high addresses. Um, what? What do we use to get memory allocated on the heap? Exactly. So kind of any bytes that we malloc go on the heap. Uh, if we were using C++, there's uh, the keyword new that puts stuff on the heap. The keyword in Java, new, does the same thing. It allocates objects on the heap. Um, 
who is who is managing the kind of allocation deallocation on the heap? Kelly. Okay. Yeah, sort of manual slash the programmer. We might also say. It's dynamic, kind of compare like to distinguish it from this kind of static data, like our heap, kind of at any point dirt while the program is running, there could be memory allocated or deallocated on the heap. And it's the programmer that has to kind of manually do all these all these allocations, deallocations. Um, any guesses for our, our heap permissions? Sorry? Uh, just like the stack, we don't want people to be able to just like put code in here and execute it, so it won't be executable. Uh, would we need to read and write stuff in the heap? Yeah, not going to be very useful if we can't read and write it. So uh, we're getting close to done. Uh, something, anything that's missing that our program might need? Something that we can execute normally. Yeah, we need we need you know the actual code for the program to run. That's got to be in memory. We have code down here. Um, it's the assembly instructions uh, that our program produced. Uh, this is also going to be static. Kind of when the program starts up, all the code loaded into this region, and we're set. Uh, and so, yeah, we're definitely going to need to be able to execute this code region. Uh, if we couldn't execute it, that would be a problem. Uh, in order to execute it, we actually have to be able to like read the, the bytes there and, and send them to the CPU, so it's going to be readable. Uh, just do you think that the code should be writable or not? Huh? I mean, probably not, right? That's just another vulnerability. Like, if we're able to execute this, um, and like people using this, your your program will be able to understand it and execute it. They're also able to change it, and they can exploit vulnerabilities. Exactly. The code region will not be writable. It's kind of read only. So yeah, programs can't change their their code while they're running. Uh, our last region here I'll call uh, literals. Um, so we can think of this is where uh, static constant data goes. If there's some kind of data that should be globally available, it's not some, say, local variable, but you shouldn't be able to change it. It should just have the same value the whole time. Global, global variables we can read and write. Literals is going to be read only. And we'll see an example of like what this, what this would be uh, in a moment. All right, uh, what are your questions on uh, this whole, this whole chart. Yeah. So when like the, the last section on the quiz had something that I would have assumed was a literal kind of baked into the code instructions, why can't we just bake in literals into the code? Why do we need a separate section? Um, so as we'll see, one example of literal is any time you have a kind of a literal string in your program. So something in double quotes, the bytes for that string need to be stored somewhere in memory uh, and on uh, for kind of x86 processes, we tend to kind of have a separate region of memory for these literal values that we're actually not going to be able to modify. So kind of a string literal needs to be in memory somewhere, and we we stick it there. Um, yeah. So they are, uh, and then the sort of address of that literal does get literally baked into the the code as you've been working on the bomb. Um, we've seen that kind of. When, uh, say, a, a format string is getting passed somewhere, we're just moving sort of the literal address of that string into, into a register. Uh, other questions? Kevin. So why is this, the memory allocated to the stack, um, like, allocated to 
calculate the back compiler design. But then uh, static literals and the code itself is initialized at, um, like, on initialization. Because does it compiling happen before initialization? Yeah, so the distinction that I'm, I'm trying to make here is that these static pieces, uh, they're just initialized once at the beginning of the program. They're not changed. Uh, and then the stack, the instructions that modify the stack, those are generated at compile time. And then this means that while the program is running, these are sort of happen automatically. Like the programmer doesn't have to manually say, like, subtract from RSP, add RSP. So uh, it's a good point that sort of it's not that the stack allocation and deallocation is somehow happening in compile time before the program is running. It's just the instructions that, that uh, control this generate at compile time, and then that makes it sort of automatic as the program runs. Other questions? Paul? Well, so I'm still a little confused. Then. So what exactly is stored in code? Like, is it code in the sense of what we write as like a programmer kind of code, or is it like what we write? Uh, it is literally the assembly instructions that your code gets compiled to. So the assembly that you've been looking at for the bomb, those are all stored at like addresses that are like 400 something. That's the, that's what is in this code region. Other questions? All right, let's look at uh, a demonstration of how this is all going to work. So uh, I have a, a text file here uh, on Mantis, and um, I'm going to have a main function. And I'm just going to have sort of all the different types of data uh, that we've talked about. Um, I might have a kind of local array of 10 doubles. Um, if I wanted to have an array of 10 doubles but on the heap, uh, we know that I need to use malloc. Uh, how, would I, how would I use malloc to get this array of 10 doubles? Yeah, so the number of bytes that I want in this array is however many bytes it takes to store a double times the number of doubles I want. That's 10 of them. Um, and then I would presumably want this in some sort of variable. Maybe I'd call it heap array. Uh, what type uh, would this heap array variable be? Yeah, we'd have it's a, a pointer to the first element of our array of 10 doubles, double star. Sometimes I see that like we typecast malloc. Mm -hmm. Do we have to do that? Uh, that's just a style thing, and it can catch certain bugs where I'm basically, if I do this, I'm sort of making it explicit on the right hand side of this equals that this thing should be assigned to something of type double star. And if I have a bug in my program where the thing on the left side is not type double star, the compiler will warn me about that. Um, whereas if I don't have this, Whatever is on the whatever pointer type is on the left hand side, it will automatically do that casting. Um, so a kind of minor minor style thing. Um, all right. So then, if I want a string literal, that's something in, that's in kind of double quotes in the program. Uh, uh, maybe a happy little string. Um, and if I want a global variable, this is going to be a variable that's defined outside any function, because any variable I define inside a function is kind of local to that function and will go away when that function returns. So I'd say I have a global var equals to it, like so. Um, so we have these different types of data, and I would need to include the standard lib to get malloc, and I'm going to want to print some stuff out. So that's in standard IO. Uh, and we can actually just print out sort of all the addresses we can think of to sort of see that indeed this is working the way that we expect. 
So I might say uh, print kind of local array percent p is printed as a pointer local array. Uh, and then if I hold uh, Alt and Shift in VS Code and use the down arrow, it just copies the line. Uh, so I want to have my uh, heap array and maybe the address of the heap array uh, will have the string literal and then the address of the string literal and have and look at the address of our global var uh, and we can even look at the address of the function main or the address of the function malloc and see where where in memory are those living. Uh, any questions on this code so far? Alright, so let's compile and <clears throat> if I just sort of do basic, uh, some of the basic compilation things we talked about, use dash o to say uh, make a pro an executable file called mem-layout and then give it mem-layout.c. And I can run this uh, and then I can see run mem layout uh, and so we can see that uh, kind of the local array is at a higher address than the heap array uh, this address of heap array looks like it has an address similar to this local array now, what is the distinction kind of between these two lines and kind of why does one of them look like the local array address? Huh? Is it maybe because the local array is in static data and that's near to the heap? And the heap goes from the bottom up? Uh, that's a reasonable guess. I will tell you that the local that the local array is indeed on the stack. And when we see addresses that start with 7 FFFF, that's a clue that it's sort of high addresses and is, is part of the stack. What was that? The address of the variable heap array is on the stack, but like the but that, that variable is containing a pointer to whatever we uh, allocated on the heap. Exactly. The heap array is a, the variable itself, we just print out the value of heap array. We get the memory address that it's, it's pointing to. That's this heap address here. But heap array itself is a local variable that contains a pointer to the heap. So if we get the address of the local variable, it's on the stack. So there's a heap address that's stored as a local variable on the stack. Does that make sense? Um, and we can see that kind of main is, uh, and, and there's a weird thing going on with main and malloc, where kind of main is kind of also, it seems like in these middle addresses, and malloc is up here at the top. And so uh, we're seeing that at least how I've compiled this program now, it's, uh, there's kind of a little more messiness than this kind of nice, uh, uh, clean kind of model that, that I've built up. Uh, one other sort of messy thing is every time I run this, the addresses are uh, are different. Like this local array is actually at two different addresses uh, when I run this two times. Um, this is another security feature uh, that actually kind of randomizes which addresses uh, things get put out each time you run to make it harder for someone to predict 
where in memory uh, certain things will be. Uh, I can actually use a command Uh, the set arch command, you can turn off this randomization uh, and you see that kind of these addresses get, they have a lot less sort of variation in them um, and they'll also be the same every single time that I run it if I turn off this sort of randomization security feature. Um, there are a few other things I can do uh, when I compile the program to tell it to, to get it to look like what you're used to seeing in the bomb, that kind of more closely matches this diagram. One thing is I can say, uh, don't make it a position independent executable, which just means uh, make it so that kind of these things are kind of at, these regions show up at fixed addresses rather than sort of they, kind of, they can kind of float around somewhere uh, in memory. So if I do that, um, uh, interesting. That does not appear to have made any difference. What if I do that? Oh, I see what happened. I cannot put this option in between the dash O and the mem layout. I was telling it to produce a, an executable called dash no PIE. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, so when I turn off this position independent executable, I see that the heap is at kind of six, these addresses that start at 600, uh, the string literal and main and the global variable uh, global variable is an address starts with 600 kind of below that. The literals and the code, so this kind of position independent executable kind of lets these get offset to different addresses. Uh, but we still see that malloc is actually sort of up here at high addresses kind of near where the stack is. Uh, and this is because as I'm compiling it here, I'm not actually compiling, say, malloc or printf or any of these standard library functions into this code portion. They're actually getting what's called dynamically linked. They're getting inserted at the moment the program is run. And so they actually show up at a different point in memory. And if I tell GCC, I say dash static, that means don't do this dynamic linking. Actually take all these library functions and compile them into the code. Don't make it sort of dependent on kind of bringing them in at the last minute. And now we see that malloc ends up sort of where we would expect kind of in the code portion um, along, with, along with main. So uh, I think that sort of the details of how all this works in practice and how the compiler can affect it are, are interesting, um, but uh, I'm, I'm not expecting you to kind of memorize all these different flags and exactly what they do. Uh, and just being familiar with these kind of different regions and their general purpose is kind of what I hope that you, you take away from this. Mark. I still understand why the address of the heap array is like on the stack compared to everything else. Um, Yes, so uh, we can think of this as uh, our local variables end up on the stack. And so on the stack, we have our local array, our kind of array of 10 doubles. And then down here on the heap, we have our array of uh, 10 doubles that we malloced. Um, but we store, but we store the, a pointer to this array in a variable called heap array. And this heap array is a local variable to this main function. It was declared in the main function. And this heap array stores the address of this array of 10 doubles. So when we printed out heap array, we get the address 
the, the like address, the pointer is storing. When we say, give me the address of this variable itself, it's actually stored on the stack. Since it's a local variable, and then it will be, will be allocated there. Does that make sense? So then why don't we do that for the other like, stack data, static data, and literals? We only do that for the heap for me. Um, like how come we don't also store like the addresses of the other stuff in the stack? Um, I guess the um, like the uh, string uh, we do actually see that happening with the string literal as well. Uh, we see that the kind of address of um, of the string literal variable here is on the stack, um, and uh, uh, when we look at it's sort of the address that it stores, it's a kind of pointer down into uh, the literals region. Um, uh, the global variable, it's global means that it's not stored on the stack, it's just entirely. Like it's, we, we did not declare the global variable anywhere inside main, it's declared outside of it. So it's, it's not a local variable to me. So why why would the um, string liberal be stored on the stack rather than would be stored as you know, like a constant in the literal areas? Uh, so the actual string is stored in the literals area, and just the variable that I have named string literal that I declared in main that is stored on main's stack. Um, we can see that we can check. String literal, can I change a character of the string literal if this is indeed stored in a read-only region of memory, I should not be able to do that. And indeed I can't, the operating system says no, 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 and just crashes the program with a segmentation fault when I kind of violate one of these rules of, of memory. Can you go over how local write and keep write are like other memory addresses, or how or why they're like in different positions? Because aren't they kind of doing the same thing? Like aren't they both creating and go write at the same time? Um, yeah, they're creating an uh, an array of ten doubles just in different places in memory. So when I write when I write C code that's like this, I am telling the system, create this array of 10 doubles on the stack. When I call malloc like this, I am telling it, create this array of 80 bytes on the heap. And then I'm just storing the address of those 80 bytes in this variable, um, which uh, will either be on the stack or in a register. Um, because I told the program, give me the address of this, even if it was going to keep it in a register, registers don't have an address, so I'm basically forcing the program to put it on the stack so that it can have an address. Bye. Um, so what other sorts of things are stored in literals besides like string, like the, 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 the originals of the string literals and stuff? Um, like conversion constants and things like yeah, uh, particularly kind of any large constant values um, may be stored uh, in this literals area. So if you have large numeric constants, uh, those might be stored there. Um, there are, uh, I mean, I know that C plus plus enforces this more strictly, but you can declare variables as constant um, with the const keyword. Uh, and that may lead them to be stored in, a, in this sort of read-only uh, region of memory. Um, but at least the, by far the most common thing to find here is, is string literals. So, but like, yeah. would, say, I, I don't know if C, like, knows what, say, 
high end, but in a in a certain program, if like say a mathematical program, if the constant pi or e or whatever mm -hmm. was part of that program, would it be stored in literals? Uh, yeah. I mean, I have to test it to be sure, but yes, it certainly could be stored in literals. Any other questions? All right. Well, even if you don't have more questions about uh, memory layout, I'm sure you do have questions about the first US president to be assassinated. Uh, as you're probably aware, this was Abraham Lincoln. Um, this was uh, the kind of the, one of the last pictures of, of Lincoln that was, uh, uh, was taken. So, uh, 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 in 1865, the Civil War um, was uh, uh, mostly uh, mostly over, uh, and an actor by the name of John Wilkes Booth and a group of conspirators uh, planned to attack various officials in the U.S. government, including the president. Um, this was extremely consequential, um, uh, in part because in the 1864 election, Lincoln had uh, 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 and his party had removed the uh, very uh, liberal Hannibal Hamlin uh, from Maine from the uh, Republican ticket and had replaced him as vice president with Andrew Johnson, a uh, conservative, uh, a more conservative, uh, much more conservative Democrat uh, from Tennessee as sort of a, a unity. Uh, ticket, and this is a, a political cartoon from the time where Abraham Lincoln had been a rail splitter, Andrew Johnson had been a tailor, and they're sort of working together to stitch the, the country back together. Um, uh, however, Andrew Johnson um, was uh, very opposed to uh, a lot of the Republican policies of uh, promoting uh, the civil rights of uh, uh, free black people, of um, uh, putting significant requirements on Confederate states coming back in, into the Union. Um, Andrew Johnson, not an especially stable uh, person. He was, for example, uh, very hungover the morning of the inauguration, and so he took two big gulps of whiskey and then gave a sort of drunk rambling speech um, before uh, he was then quickly uh, sworn in, an embarrassment to, to everyone. Uh, he, in the, the midterms, went, went around campaigning against Republicans. Um, here's a political cartoon uh, demonstrating how his, his, he, he, his stature shrank and shrank and shrank the longer that he was kind of around campaigning. Um, and uh, it got to the point where uh, Andrew Johnson, the first uh, U.S. president to be impeached, so uh, you have the, the Secretary of Defense, um, Edwin Stanton, pointing the cannon labeled Congress at, uh, at Johnson over here. Um, and so uh, the, the uh, Republicans in the House impeached Johnson. Uh, he was very narrowly uh, acquitted uh, in the Senate, so he remained in office. Um, but he, he did significant damage to uh, 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 to the, the kind of reconstruction and the aims of, of Republicans. A couple other first from sort of uh, from the kind of later Civil War. Uh, this is Clara Barton, um, who uh, was uh, incredibly uh, influential in uh, treating wounded uh, soldiers and kind of setting up uh, uh, various kinds of aid. She would go on to found the American Red Cross couple decades, um, I guess a decade later. Uh, and then this was also uh, the first, this war was the first time that uh, uh, African Americans served uh, in the US military. There were uh, a number of uh, uh, units in, in which they served. And uh, one of the many tragedies of this era is that these sort of things were uh, kind of um, rolled back over the next uh, several decades. And, it was uh, a long time before um, there was uh, this kind of level of, of, of service. All right, that's our, that's our history break. So now let's do, uh, kind of remind ourselves what's, uh, what's happening with uh, procedure calls. 
This is going to be uh, very important to understand as we uh, uh, go into not that one. Here we go. So this is a little strange uh, situation, uh, but I think it gets at uh, exactly what call the call instruction does. So here we have call, and it's calling like just the address that we're giving call is the address of this label next, which is labeling the line right after call. So call, we're saying call the function that starts at this address, which is right here. Uh, and then the instruction here is, is pop qrx. Uh, and so I'd like you to think about what, when we run these two instructions, is going to actually get stored uh, in RIX. All right. So movement towards C. That's excellent. This is what will uh, what will end up in in RIX. Can anyone uh, can someone share uh, kind of why this, this is what happens, or how you thought about this? Maybe someone I, I haven't heard from yet today. Cecilia? Okay. Um, well, call puts the address of like, the next thing after it onto the stack. Um, and in this program, there's not very many lines. So the next thing is just pop Q, and that's what will be on the stack. And you Exactly. Yeah. A call. So it's getting the fact that call pushes a return address on the stack, and that is the address of the very next instruction. And then pop whatever is on top of the stack gets popped off into that register. PJ. So after the call, call the next, and then the pop Q will pop after it goes to the pop Q up. And then it's also returned to the pop Q again, right? Because they have like what is. Um, maybe I, I didn't hear. I'm not sure what you were asking. So, so, uh, so when you call, when you call the call, you go between the location of the next line into the stack, right? And then you pass that to the mouse, and then you get the port to the jump stack. So, like, how would that, how would this affect, like, where it should be coming back, coming back to the next Right, yeah. So, uh, this is a, a, like, this is clearly not really a function call. Um, this is a sort of uh, weird situation that gets at, like, the specific mechanics of what call is doing, just pushing your return address and then jumping to some address, um, which in normal, it, like, normally we use to actually make function calls. But here, where its only effect is to get the address of the next line into RAX. Um, and if after this pop Q we had a return instruction, uh, it would use kind of it wouldn't use the return address that call pushed on because that's already been popped off. It was you it would use whatever was before that on the stack, which who knows what that is. Um, other questions? All right, one more of these. So here on, on uh, the uh, pictured here is uh, what's often called a call graph. And these are uh, uh, the function names that, that uh, just came to mind. Um, there's the function slurp. It calls the function squish, which calls the function splat, which calls printf to print something. Uh, and we're going to pretend that printf doesn't call any other functions, though you know, in actuality it does, but we'll pretend it doesn't. Um, printf returns, splat returns, and then squish calls slop, which calls printf. Um, and you may remember from last time, talking about a stack frame, kind of the portion of the stack that holds the data for a particular function. And so based on uh, the function calls indicated by this graph here, uh, how many of these stack frames will be created overall, and then how many will be present on the stack at any one time, again, assuming that the program starts with slurp, uh, and these are the only functions that are called. Uh, 
All right, bit of movement toward D. That's exactly uh, why we'll have six frames and, and four at one time. Um, any questions on, on this one? Does this make sense? Paul? Can you say again what a st uh, stack frame is called? Uh, it is. Yeah, so a, a stack frame is just the region of the stack that is being used to store the data for a particular function. So uh, uh, if a function has local variables, if it calls another function has a return address, if it put arguments to some function onto the stack, that would all be part of that function stack frame. Um, and so we can think of any every time a function is called, if it uses stack space, kind of a new stack frame is pushed onto the stack, um, often by subtracting from RSP. And then when a function returns, its stack frame is popped off, usually by adding back to RSP. So yeah. in that case, six frames will, will be created, but only one frame is active at any given time? Um, so we, it depends on what you mean by active. Um, so our code is executing like one function at a time. So if you mean that we're executing one function at a time, therefore that's the active stack frame, then yes, one at a time. Uh, but slurp starts, kind of its stack frame gets pushed onto the stack. It calls squish, and slurp stack frame is still there, but now we have another one for squish, and then another one for splat, and another one for printf, but then printf returns, we pop that off. And so on. So that's why I kind of, uh, we have as many at one time as sort of as deep as this sort of chain of functions goes. Other questions? All right. So one thing that I, I wanted to kind of give you a, a bit of a, a demonstration of is uh, Kali saved registers and why we would actually, how they are useful. Um, so for this, I have function here. There we go. There we go. So uh, if we look just at this C code here, uh, we have some function Q. We don't know what it does, uh, but we do know it takes in a long and returns a long. Uh, and then I have the implementation of a function p, takes in two longs, uh, and then it calls q with y, calls q with x, and then returns this u plus v. So when, uh, let's, before we look at the assembly, let's think about some registers that are, are going to be used. Uh, so x and y, what register will x be in? RDI. RDI. How about Y? RDI. Very good. Uh, when we before we call Q, what would need like what register would we need to set up in order to do like Q called with Y? RDI. Yeah, we'd need to get the value of Y into RDI. Uh, we did say X was an RDI. Do we need to use X after this point? Yes. yes. Yeah, because we need to pass it to the, the second call of Q. So we have this dilemma of we currently have X in RDI, but we need to replace that with the value of Y. And we need to somehow make sure that we have the value of X you know, around for uh, uh, to put back an RDI when we call Q with X. Does that make sense? And so one nice way of doing this is to move X into one of our Kali saved registers, in this case RBP, because we know that RBP being Kali saved will not change between before we call Q and after. Because Q is just not allowed to change any of the values that are in Kali saved registers. Or if it does change them, it has to like save the old value and then put it back. So this means that if we put
put x, this value that we need to kind of exist after this function call in one of these call stage registers, we can count on it still being around. And then when we return, we can kind of move our saved value of x in the RDI to pass to the, the second call of q. Does that make sense? So this is uh, one of the kind of main reasons to have this convention around call these saved registers. So there's a register you can put something in uh, that you can trust you'll, uh, you can find that value uh, still there later. I say. So if Q then calls something, could it put something in a call saved register that's already been used? Like it could put, it, put something in like uh, RBC? Yes, but because it's Kali saved, the function Q calls would also have to preserve that value. And so you may end up with a bunch of copies of kind of the old value of RBP pushed onto the stack to sort of save, save them temporarily, and then they all get popped off by the time we return all the way back to P. Kevin? Um, when you call, so in the line forward call QY, right? And then Y is in. RSI at that moment. Mm -hmm. So when when the function Q calls that, does then RSI get mapped to RDI? Uh, the assembly specifically moves RSI into RDI before calling Q. So it, it moves Y into the register for the first argument. Okay, so then before that happens, you need to save the first argument, which is text in RDP. Exactly, yes. Um, so why are we moving Y to RDI then? Uh, RDIs are register for the first argument, and we need Q to have Y as its as its first argument. Yeah. What was again? Uh, so let's bring up this picture. So here's our kind of diagram of these different conventions. And we have registers that are caller saved, which one way to think about that is that uh, if I call a function, it's allowed to change the values in, in any of the caller saved ones. But it's not allowed to change the values in the callee saved ones, meaning that the function being called has the responsibility to preserve or save the values in these blue registers, whereas it's free to change the ones in the caller saved meaning that me as the caller, if I need to save the value in RDI, which in this example I did, I need to put it somewhere that's not one of these callers. I need to save it somewhere else and so that it's still around for later. Mm -hmm. Fine. So what happens when you run out of callee save registers? If you have you know, all of these functions stacked before they can pop themselves. Yes, yeah, so uh, Reddit, we prefer to use registers when we can because we know they're much faster to access than memory, uh, but memory is, is very large. So if we run out of registers, we just have to start putting everything in, in memory. And then what holds on, does something hold on to the pointer of that memory or is it just in stack and get popped? Yeah, for, for whenever we're kind of saving the value of a register, the idea is we put it somewhere and then we kind of move it back uh, later. So sometimes we can, that somewhere that we put it could be a Kali saved register. We could also just push it onto the stack and then pop it off uh, when we need it. I think. Um, I have a question about the, the code. Sure. Uh, I am kind of confused um, why the, um, the stack memory is increased if you're just moving things like, between the registers. Yes, so uh, this is something that I, that, that you will often see uh, the C compiler do is just allocate a little bit more stack space than it actually needs. Um, 
it's possible that if we turn up the optimis, sometimes if you turn up the optimizations, um, this this reordered these but did not actually get rid of it. We'll see how. All right. So in this case, any optimization level, we still have these eight bytes uh, allocated on the stack. So uh, I don't have a satisfying explanation for kind of why. Uh, in this particular example, is allocate, the compiler wants to allocate these eight bytes. Uh, potential reasons are uh, alignment. Um, on a 64-bit system, uh, it will, the system will often try and align things to multiples of 16, and sometimes adjusting by eight uh, can accomplish that. Um, there's also, because our return address is sitting on the stack, Allocating a bit of sort of uh, extra room around that return address can uh, prevent it from getting overwritten in certain cases. Uh, this will be kind of uh, a crucial fact when we talk about buffer overflows is sort of how much, how much space do we have to sort of overwrite in order to, to mess with the return address. Um, but uh, I don't see any reason why this uh, allocation of eight bytes would be related to the correctness of this uh, implementation. So I would expect it would be either for efficiency or security. Any other questions? All right. Well, that should do it for today. Uh, Keep working on uh, the bomb lab due on Friday. I have office hours uh, starting shortly, and I'll see you later.